Cool, now we are talking. So thanks for this nice welcome and thanks for being here and having me. This talk is about architecture and so on. And I want to start with a question. Have you ever wondered what it takes for a real good architecture? A sustainable one, a maintainable one, an architecture you can live with for the next, let's say, 20 years. Well, in my opinion, it takes a lot of experience. Experience of a diverse group of people where everyone can bring in their lessons learned. And of course, there are some ways to accelerate the creation of a good architecture. For instance, you could go with caffeine or, of course, with pizza. When it comes to pizza, I'm very recommending Pizza Provinciale. Perhaps you know Pizza Provinciale. It's the pizza with corn and with bacon and ham on it. I only made good experiences with it, especially in the area of architecture. But when we stick to experience, a big question is how can we move experience from one hat to another hat? And to answer this question, a lot of people have written down best practices. And some people try to formalize this. They have written down patterns, design patterns, architectural patterns, something like this. And then some people took a lot of patterns, they took a lot of best practices, they added a bit of philosophy, and so they are ended up with a whole methodology. And design, domain-driven design, is one of those methodologies. A methodology that helps you to create a nice architecture that addresses all your requirements. And to be honest, domain-driven design has been around for quite a while. It has been around for about 20 years, but nevertheless, it contains some things that might come in handy for your front-end architecture. And this is what this talk is about. In this talk, I will show you how you can improve your front-end architecture by using some ideas of domain-driven design. And this is the important thing for me. It's about ideas from domain-driven design. For me, domain-driven design is not a religion. It is just a methodology that has some things that can come in handy. Saying this regarding the contents of this talk, we will start with strategic design, which is one part of domain-driven design, if you ask me the most important one. Then we will look at the same coin, but from another perspective. We will look at the other side of the coin from the technical perspective, and for this I will talk about monorepos. And then we will try to take those two parts, the methodological part, the technical part, and to combine them using an axe and monorepos depending upon an axe. At the end of the day, I will give you a short demonstration that shows everything in context. But first of all, let me introduce myself. I am Manfred, I am a trainer and consultant for Angola. Nowadays, I'm helping a lot of companies with Angular trainings, with Angular consultancy. And I'm also part of the Google Developer Expert team. I'm quite proud of this. Since the beginning of this year, I'm also part of the Angular team. There, I am a trusted collaborator. I've helped to implement some new features for the CLI 8. For instance, I've helped with differential loading. I'm doing a lot of stuff in Austria and Germany, and if I'm behaving well, then I'm sometimes allowed to enter other countries like yours here. My current product is also about Angola. It's a workshop regarding Angola in the enterprise. We are doing this workshop in some cities, and more often we are doing this workshop in some country, in some company, as an in-house one. Okay, so let's get started with the first topic. Let's get started with strategic design. So if you look at domain-driven design, this methodology I've told you about, you have two big disciplines. And one discipline is strategic design, the other one is tactical design. And strategic design is all about decomposing a big system into tinier parts. That means you don't want to have this huge system that can do everything. Instead of this, you want to have several tiny systems that are less complex. Tactical design is mostly about design patterns and practices. 
Here I will stick with strategic design because, as you can imagine, this influences your architecture most. And if you would ask me to show you just one slide that explains what strategic design is about, I would say it prevents this situation here. This very situation where you have a big system where everything is intermingled with everything else. Of course, something like this is not sustainable, something like this is not maintainable. Let me give you an example. When I've prepared for this presentation, one system came in mind, namely an e-procurement system that allows employees to order some stuff, for instance, a sheet of paper or a pencil or perhaps a new laptop. By the way, this was the first software system I was fully responsible for. It was about 20 years ago. And you know, your first project is like your first big laugh. You will never forget it. It will always be somehow in your mind. And if you would write something like this, you would not write this big, clumsy e-procurement system. You would write several tiny systems instead. For instance, a catalog system or an approval system where the manager can say yes or no, or an ordering system that sends out the orders. Or in our case, we had a specification system where an expert has done a fine specification for your requirements. For instance, you said as an employee, I need a new laptop, and the expert said, oh, you are a power user, you get this laptop, or oh, you are not a power user, you get this, let's say, tablet or this weak laptop. A very nice example back then we had in our uh, documents was perhaps someone is requesting a CD burner. You see, it has been a long time. And the CD burner was back then an object of prestige. And not everyone is allowed to have a CD burner, the people say it's there. And so the specification folks have to decide upon whether this person deserves the CD burner or not. Funny example, if you ask me. Well, you will decompose your whole big system into tiny parts, and those parts are called subdomains. And this is really the hardest part of it, finding good subdomains. One interesting thing about subdomains is that each and every subdomain can have the same entities, but they can have a slightly different meaning. Just look at my catalog system and at my approval system. Both has a product, but the product itself has a completely different meaning. The product in the catalog is a big thing because the whole catalog is about products. It contains not only a title and a description, it contains a range of prices, rabat ranges and so on, discount ranges. It contains a lot of pictures and Q&As. When it comes to approval, pictures, Prices, Q&As are not that interesting. For the manager, the selected price is interesting, the selected title, and of course the budget that is used to pay for this product. So as you see here, you have the same names, but behind those names you have completely different concepts. And when it comes to domain-driven design, you not even try to unify those concepts. Because if you try to unify those concepts, you have this big product entity that is connected to everything in your system. And so you will end up with a not good architecture where everything is intermingled with everything else. So there is one term you will probably see when you look into domain-driven design. It's the bounded context. Normally, each and every subsystem, each and every subdomain has a bounded context. And this bounded context defines the boundaries within your model is meaningful. Your model is not meaningful without this context. It just has a specific meaning within it. Within this context, we have this general language. This general language everyone should use. This general language that should mirror the domain. That means you will not invent new terms as a developer. You will just use the terms that are used in the domain to mirror it, to make it more maintainable and to make it more useful for the domain experts, the users. 
So if you are ending up with several subdomains, you will quickly find out that those subdomains have to communicate with other. For instance, the specification subdomain needs some product data from the catalog, and so does the approval domain, and so does the ordering domain. And of course, you could say, hey, everyone is allowed to access the catalog, but this would not be a nice step, because if the catalog changes, you have breaking changes everywhere else. So it is not a good idea to give everyone full access to a domain. One thing that might be a bit better, it's still not the best solution, but it's a next step uh, towards a better solution, is using a shared kernel, which is just a shared library, which is used by each and every domain. The owners of those domains can put the common things into those shared kernel, and everyone is responsible for it. And you know, and this is the drawback, if everyone is responsible for something, at the end of the day, no one is responsible for it. And you will have breaking changes if you don't take care and if people don't look at all the changes very closely. Another strategy that could come in handy is just providing an API, which means that you have your domain and you are just providing a tiny API and everyone else is only allowed to access this API, these components, this part of your state, these services. Everything else is hidden behind the API, which means that everything else can be changed by you. But if you change something that affects the API, you have to be sure to be backwards compatible to not create breaking changes for other domains. The official term here is not API, the official term here is open or host service. I'm just calling it API because API fits better in this tiny black box here. Okay, and when you look at domain-driven design, you will find a lot of additional ideas for inter-domain communication. So this was the first part of the coin, it was the methodological part of the coin. Now let's move to the technical side of the coin, which is about mono repositories. A mono repository is a drop dev simple thing. It is just a big project that contains a lot of sub projects. You can compose your big application into tinier, more or less self contained parts, and all those parts go perhaps here in this project folder. And this is several advantages. One advantage is this node modules folder here. Not that it exists, but that it exists just once. That means that all your sub-projects are using the same version of Angular, the same version of Rx. And this is probably a nice thing, because just imagine you would use Angular 5 here and Angular 7 there and then you try to compile everything together, I guarantee you all hell would break loose. This is prevented by this structure here. Another advantage is sharing your libraries is not difficult. Just check it in in the source control and your colleagues will check it out from source control and get a state, a bunch of libraries that can work together, that have been tested together. So creating a workspace is quite easy nowadays. You can leverage the CLI. Perhaps you have seen this. You install the CLI, you new up a new workspace, and then you can generate an application within this CLI or a library. Of course, you can also generate further applications or further libraries. Then you can serve your application and then you can build your library or either your application just by pointing to the name of your piece of code. So this is really quite straightforward. If you love this idea with decomposing a big system into tinier parts, if you love this idea of monorepos, I would look into NX. NX is what I'm calling the sugar dip on top of the Angular CLI. It enhances the CLI by some features that are very in handy when it comes to mono repositories. Just let me show you one of those features. One of those features is you can easily visualize which libraries you have, 
visualize which applications you have and visualize which part of the system is accessing which other parts. And this is very vital in big business software systems because normally you want to avoid that every part is accessing every other part. In this case, you would have a highly coupled system that is not maintainable. Here we are seeing we are good. Uh, not everything is intermingled. Uh, everything is perhaps using this common validation library, but this is okay -ish. Okay, now we have seen two things. The methodology, domain-driven design, strategic design, decomposing your system into tiny parts. And we have seen the technical story, which is about monorepos. Now let's bring everything together. Let's talk about how we can combine this idea of strategic design with an X-based monorepos. And if I would do this, first of all, I would just create folders for all my domains. Here I'm just sticking with two domains for the sake of the uh, tiny screen, of course. I would also add a shared kernel, a artificial shared domain, which contains the shared kernel and other shared technical libraries. And then within those folders, I would start with creating libraries, layers of libraries. The first layer is what I'm calling the feature layer. The feature layer contains libraries with feature modules. Every feature module contains just one feature, one use case, like order a product or approve a product. So you would end up with several feature libraries here. Then the next layer of libraries is a layer of UI libraries. They contain dump components. Components that are not aware of features, components that are not aware of use cases, but components that can help to implement them. Just think about a date time picker. The date time picker is not interested into the use case it is used in. It is just there and so it can be used across several use cases, across several features. Or think about an address component. Many business products have this address component that assures that the address looks the same in each and every use case. The next layer contains your domain logic, which is about validation logic, which is about calculations. And then you have utilities with general stuff you need everywhere. When you are doing this, when you are introducing layers, you can easily introduce a rule. This rule is called relaxed layering. Relaxed layering means that each and every layer is only allowed to access the layers below. In this situation, this means features are allowed to use the UI, the domain, utils. The domain is only allowed to use the util layer. The util layer is not allowed to use anything. This prevents cycles, for instance. Just think about a situation where everything is allowed to access everything. You would end up with cycles, and perhaps you know it, TypeScript is not that amused about cyclic dependencies. And in addition, it's also not good for a system you want to maintain, you want to reason about. Because, you know, when everything is intermingled, we've talked about this. Well, every rule has an exception, and the exception here is that the UI layer is not allowed to use the domain layer because UI components are dump components. They shall not know the use case. The data picker is not interested in your use case. So this is the first kind of access restrictions that helps you to prevent uh, cycles, that helps you to have a proper structure. The second restrictions are about domains. Here you would say each and every domain is only allowed to access things with its own domain and within the shared kernel. Catalog can only access the catalog and shared. Ordering can only access ordering and shared. Of course, also here we need an exception for this rule. As we have seen before, sometimes one domain needs access to another domain. For instance, as you have seen, the ordering domain needs the products of the catalog. 
And this is where our API comes in. Our API, which is just a library that exports specific selected things for other domains. And as mentioned, only those things need to be backwards compatible, the rest can change. So one thing that's also vital here is you should try to isolate your domain, which means the domain layer is isolated by a so-called application layer, which is the official term in domain-driven design and an infrastructure layer. Let me give you some terms of the world of Angular that explain those two layers. The application layer is about use case specific facades. And if you have followed the topic of state management in the last months, you have seen that people like to create facades that sit in front of their store, facades that provide everything you need for a use case. And the infrastructure layer, of course, is about things like data access or accessing browser APIs like the geolocation API, like IndexedDB. This you want, in general, to abstract away. You can substructure your domain library or you could also create several libraries for those aspects. It's up to you. But the point here is isolate your domain. Perhaps you are wondering why I'm creating that tiny libraries. You have seen each and every feature module has its own library. And creating tiny libraries has several advantages. One advantage is a tiny library can be the unit of recompilation. You do not want to recompile everything all the time. You just want to recompile the changed things. The same holds true for testing. It can be the unit of testing. And it's the unit for access restrictions to prevent cycles, to give you a meaningful architecture. It's also about information hiding, because each of those fine-grained libraries can have secrets. They don't need to expose everything to the user or to other libraries. And it can be a future replacement for NG modules. Perhaps you've heard it, the Angular team is not that amused about NG modules. They need it, but they don't like it. And they are currently investigating ways to make NG modules optional. And if they become optional, you could use libraries with barrels and so on instead of those modules. You could use things that are directly baked into ECMAScript instead. Okay, let me show you a demonstration for this. In this demonstration, I've brought a mono repository. It's based upon uh, an axe, and this repository has a libs folder. And, oh, you see nothing, okay, sorry. Now we are talking, thank you. You see this mono repository with a libs folder, and as you see here, this libraries folder has one subfolder per each subdomain. There is a catalog folder, there is an ordering folder, there is a shared folder for the shared kernel. Let's drill into it. For instance, let's drill into the catalog domain. Here we have our libraries of all the layers. And what I'm doing here, and this is also one of the best practices the nice people behind NX wrote down, every application, every library has a prefix where the prefix is the name of the layer. So I can clearly see, okay, those two parts belong to the feature layer or this part here belongs to the domain layer. If you look into your domain layer, you have a lot of generated files and this index.ts. And I'm always saying this index.ts is reason enough to define libraries, to define a lot of libraries, because this index.ts is some kind of facade, some kind of barrel, some kind of public API. It exposes everything the other libraries can use. Everything that is not exposed here is hidden and, as mentioned before, can be changed all the time. Let's have a look at the feature. There is a feature browse products with a feature module, as you see here. 
And as you see, of course, the feature module uh, Browse Products is using the catalog domain. It is importing the ng module of the catalog domain. And for this, I'm using map names. This is quite pretty. I'm not using something like dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash projects. I'm just using a map name, which helps me to stay sane. On the other side, it's also a nice thing because that means I can move my libraries around. My code is not aware of the location of those libraries. And if you're wondering where the resolution of those name is, you will find it in your dsconfig. And NX is taking care about this. NX is taking care about this. It is just writing those mappings here that tells the compiler that e-procurement catalog domain points to the facade, to the index DS of this very library. Okay, this is nice so far, but it can get even nicer. Let's, for instance, show the dependency graph. It is just an NPM script that comes with NX. And here it is, my dependency graph. And now, as in every good romantic movie, I'm saying one sentence, namely, let us do something crazy. Let us start Edge. <laughs> I'm doing this for a specific purpose. Edge has this nice presentation feature where I can take a pencil here and mark my domains. So when you look at the structure here, then you see my domains. For instance, you see, hey, there is a shell of the catalog domain. There is a feature of the catalog domain. There is another feature belonging ui, to the catalog domain. <laughs> ui. And there is my domain layer. Nice, isn't it? There is also another domain. For instance, my ordering domain with an ordering shell, with an ordering feature, and so on. By the way, the catalog API is also part of my catalog domain. It exposes stuff for other domains. And then there is shared stuff. The UI address library is part of my shared uh, kernel, as well as the util authentication library. And so you can see at first sight, yes, I have several domains here, and they are not intermingled with each other. There is a way to access parts of those domains, and this way is really defined. It is well defined. I can access the API or the shared kernel. And now let's do something that's very bad. Let's do something like this. Let's access an UI part from our util layer. Normally, a util layer is not allowed to access UI parts because your authentication logic should not directly use some component. It is just a logic. And it is also against my layering rules when you are remembering this matrix I've showed you before. Utils have been on the bottom of this matrix and UI have been somewhere above it. So let's try to do this. For this, I'm switching to my, oh, what have I done? For this, I'm switching to my shared module. And here I have prepared some bad code. And you see immediately, boom, a project tagged with util can only depend on libraries with yeah, nothing. Uh, which means, in good English, a util layer is not allowed to use any other layer to prevent cycles. You can have restrictions like this all the way for all the things I've shown you before. It is just a matter of linting. You can configure your NX-based monorepo with linting roles that take care about this. The best thing about this is you can also run this linting stuff on the command line. I guess you know it. ng-lint project util shared out. And then we should get the same slap into our face. We are not allowed to use this library from the utility layer. 
And now if you think one step further, perhaps you are still doing this, you could introduce this into your source control system. And so perhaps the source control system does not even allow you to check something like this in, to check code in that drives across the one way. Okay, so let me sum up. What have we seen today? We have seen that it is probably a good idea to slice your application in subdomains, in tiny self-contained subdomains to prevent this intermingled situation. This is also what I'm calling vertical slicing. And then you should slice the whole things into layers. This is what I'm calling horizontal slicing. And you should use something like layering, could be strict layering or non-strict layering, which is also called relaxed layering, where just each layer is only allowed to access the layers below it. You should go with fine-grained libraries, because the library can be the unit of recompilation, the unit of retesting, and the unit for access restrictions. Saying this, enforce restrictions so that not everything is intermingled with everything else. And there is a last thing I want you to remember. If you forget everything, please always remember this one tiny aspect. It's very vital for me. Namely, when doing architecture, caffeine and pizza can accelerate the whole process. And as mentioned before, I'm recommending the pizza provinciale, you know, ham, bacon and so on. Okay, so thanks for coming. Uh, you find my coordinates here. You also find all my material on my blog. And here you have also some further information about my workshop. So thanks for coming. And if you want, follow me on Twitter so that we can stay in contact. Thank you. <laughs>